You know, some people enjoy composing their own music, chord by chord, and others are happiest when they come across that one perfect song. Work is not a lot different than that. Whether you prefer building your own workflow or using a pre-made template, with Monday.com, you and the team can work in a way that's comfortable for everyone. Tap the banner to go to Monday.com and build your own amazing workflow or find an awesome template. No judgment. A science story, huh? Scientist, they, I felt, felt I feel right. right. I was so and I just happy. Thought, well, I had figured it out. Wow. It was that tall. golden moment. Because science was on my side. Hi everyone, I'm Ben Lilly, and welcome to the Story Collider, where we bring you true personal stories about science. This week we're bringing you stories about death, from folks who have dealt with it firsthand as part of their jobs in science. Our first story this week is from Chris Gray. It was recorded in March 2017 at the Highland Ballroom in Atlanta, Georgia, in a show we produced in partnership with the Atlanta Science Festival and the Center for Chemical Evolution. So in 1994, I'm in college, and I'm sitting in the office of a professor at the veterinary school, and she's telling me about a job position she's trying to fill. All I know is that she was looking for somebody to work in her lab. And I had a history of lying to get certain jo campus jobs, <laughs> even though I wasn't in those departments. I, uh, I worked on the on-campus child care facility. I was not an education major. I worked on the campus radio station. I was not a journalism major. I worked in the computer lab, was not a computer science major. Now I'm sitting in the office of a professor in the vet school. All she tells me is that the job pays $12 an hour. Now you gotta understand, that's $1994. <laughs> the minimum wage in 1994 was $4.25. The highest paying job I had found in college up until then had been $5 an hour. And I thought I was rich getting $5 an hour. $12 an hour. Before I heard any description of the job or what I would have to do, I had already decided I am taking this job. I don't care what I have to do, $12 an hour. In college, when you're a broke college student, that, that, that was going to change my life. $12 an hour. I could now work part-time and make more than I had been making working full-time and going to school full-time. I could take less student loans and actually pay some of my college tuition with what I was making. I could finally get an apartment without five roommates. <laughs> Maybe I could get a car. Maybe I could stop buying my clothes at the Goodwill. Maybe I can finally get involved in some social events in college instead of having to always come up with an excuse why I couldn't go because I didn't have any money. I could finally take a girl out on a date instead of trying to be all creative and slick and being like, oh, why don't we just like watch a movie back at my place? Because that costs nothing. <laughs> so I was going to take this job. She continued telling me that she had had a hard time finding someone to stay in the position. That should have been a, a, another red flag. <laughs> Because all I could think at the time was, how could someone not keep a $12 an hour job? <laughs> Impossible. I am your man. So she said, okay, we'll try you out for a week. See how it goes. So she walks me over to her research lab, introduces me to her research assistant. And there's like other grad students working in there. Everybody's like a nice, I don't know, it wasn't a med school, but they had on like lab coats. And I was like, okay, we we're doing some real like, like science shit in here. <laughs> and I was like, do I get a lab coat too? You know, it's going to be awesome. <laughs> so the re her research assistant says, okay, part of your job will be, you know, 
general cleanliness of the lab. You'll clean up, you know, glassware, things like that. And I was like, cool, I can do that. Uh, you'll also be monitoring the experiments. And what they were doing in this lab was they were testing different drugs, different pharmaceuticals. Um, and he's like, you know, we, we have the samples, we have the Petri dishes, you'll monitor them, you'll, you know, write on the chart. If there's Petri dishes where there's contamination or some of the cells have died, you'll discard those and you'll move the other ones into these warming trays that are just kind of, they keep moving and rotating in these large fume hoods. It's like, I can do it. Easy. Really? No one could do this for $12 an hour? And he said, but your most important job is... Uh, for all of our experiments in this lab, uh, they're done on kidney cells. So your job is to harvest kidney cells and prepare the, the Petri dishes for the experiments. So then I got a little worried. <laughs> and he, this <laughs> research assistant, he's like, oh, no, no, you're fine. It's just, it's, and he goes over to this bank of cages, and they're like 10 cages. Each one has a little white rabbit. And he's like, no, we use rabbit cells. So now, you ever feel like your ears getting hot? <laughs> like you've talked yourself into a situation and you're like, oh, okay. And in his defense, he was like just real jovial about it. He's like, I'm going to show you how to do it. He takes a rabbit out of one of the cages. And all, the lab has all these stainless steel tables. And so he puts a rabbit down. And then he begins to put out like, it's like, you know, like puppy pads? Like putting those all over the table. Like he's like making this weird, weird kind of like Dexter kill room with puppy pads. <laughs> and I just keep thinking, $12 an hour. $12 an hour. Puts the little rabbit into this contraption that just has a hole so, so its head could stick out. And he goes, don't worry, we, you know, we're not barbarians here. We do this very humanely. He takes a little uh, pediatric needle, inserts it into a little vein in the rabbit's ear, and then he gets a syringe, which I later find out that we have to check out because uh, it has like a DEA number because it was some really crazy drug shit. Um, <laughs> And he like puts it in the syringe and just gives a little bit as a sedative. I want to say it was phenobarbital, could be wrong. Um, I just know that if I, I was ever caught with it outside the lab, I was going to jail. <laughs> so, <laughs> so he gives it to the rabbit. Rabbit just like falls asleep. He takes it out of the thing. And then he goes, see, that was easy. And I said, okay, yeah, that looked pretty easy. And then he whipped up a scalpel and then started slicing into the rabbit. And so... I'm just like staring in horror, like, like not even like really the sight of blood that's freaking me out. It was just the casualness of the way he did it. It was just like, zoop, like Sweeney Todd. And he just like, like he should have burst into song while he was doing it. And then he had another moment of levity where he's like showing me how to like basically remove the kidneys. And, uh, and he goes, hey, you know that urban legend, you know, about the guy who like drinks something, then he wakes up in a bathtub of ice and like his kidneys are gone and it says, call 911. And he goes, I'm going to show you why that's bullshit. And I said, like, ooh, I can't wait to see this. <laughs> so he clips one kidney and he goes, look, rabbit's still, still breathing. And I'm like, uh-huh. And then he clips the second one, rabbit stops breathing. And he goes, see, that's why that would never happen. And I was like, that's a long way to go to prove a story I didn't believe in the first place was fake. So then he said, well, you know, now it's your turn. So I, you know, with shaking hands, you know, have to do, and I just keep thinking $12 an hour, $12 an hour. And I like, you know, go through the whole thing with, a, you know, and I did it. And he's like, all right. Every Monday, you get 10 cages and you're supposed to harvest all the kidneys, and then very scientifically put them into a blender. There was just like a, you know, a blender like you would get at service merchandise. Remember that back in the day? <laughs> service merchandise at Sears competitor? Yeah, y'all don't know, it's pre-Amazon. But just a standard blender, 
make yourself a nice little kidney shake, and then pour that into each one of the Petri dishes, and, and then they would put another solution on it, and that's what they would test the, the drugs on. So, every Monday, to me, was the kill day. Sunday nights, I couldn't sleep. I'd have anxiety attacks. Because I knew, well, you know how people say their Monday sucks? My Monday, <laughs> like, every Monday morning, if your Monday involved, like, you know, traffic and then murder, <laughs> you know? Yeah, got a case of the Mondays, <laughs> yeah. So I made it through the first week. And I made it through the second week. After a while, it just, it was, I became like Lucy in the candy factory. I was just, you know, just kind of doing it, just, you know, just muscle memory. And everybody was just like, $12 an hour, 12 I think I spent a lot of that $12 an hour on booze because I was just like, I got to deaden what's happening. So one day, Going through the procedure, get the rabbit, I put in the little rabbit stocks. And I go to insert the needle. The rabbit started screaming. Up until that moment, I didn't know rabbits made noise at all. Never heard a rabbit make a noise. I just thought it was like, you know, like a barkless dog. I was like, yeah, rabbits just don't make noise. I don't know how they communicate. Must be through some ESB something. <laughs> Didn't know they made noise. This rabbit started screaming. It, sa it, it sounds like a baby crying. And in a, in, a, in a, you know, institutional laboratory, like at a university, linoleum floors, cinder block walls, it is just echoing in the lab. It is echoing down the hallway. Like I'm imagining people poking their heads out of other labs going, what is going on down there? And I am just panicking because first of all, I didn't know noise was going to come out of it. And it, it, is, it is screaming and screaming. And I keep thinking, $12 an hour, $12 an hour. I, I can't lose this job. No, you know, I, 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 and I'm panicking. So I start hitting the rabbit. So it stops screaming. Afterwards, I look around. I'm the only one in the lab. So I take the rabbit and I tie it up in one of the little a bag and I get rid of it. Later, when the research assistant came in, he said, I noticed there weren't as many, you know, Petri dishes, kidney cells. And I lied and said, oh, yeah, one of the rabbits, for some reason, was already dead in the cage. I mean, I don't, I don't know what happened. I mean, weird. And he just said, okay. And we went on with the experiments that week. Now, I kept that job for four semesters every Monday. And when I tell people this story, they always, they sometimes ask, you know, how could you do that? And sometimes when I hear myself telling this story, I ask myself, how could you do that? It was for $12 an hour. So today, sometimes when I watch the news, read the news, you hear horrible stories, you hear about like a police officer who's killed somebody. You hear about a politician or, you know, who's poisoned a community's water or they've taken or trying to take away somebody's rights because of, you know, their gender or their religious beliefs or any horrible thing. And I ask, how can they do that? I sometimes think, well, maybe it's just the best job they've ever had and they don't want to lose it. And the moment something begins to scream out of protest, all they want to do is silence that voice as quickly as possible. 
so they don't get fired. Thank you. That was Chris Gray. Chris Gray is a comedian and storyteller based in Atlanta. You can see him there doing stuff and saying things in front of an audience or to just one person in intimate conversation. He is also a really good sleeper. Our second story today is from Rachel Burks. It was recorded in February 2017 at Oberon in Cambridge, Massachusetts. The theme was Light and Dark. You know, if you ask scientists and you say, you know, what's a, what's a question you get asked a lot? And, and we, we get asked lots of questions, but we tend to get asked the same question a lot. And I've got a friend who is an astronomer who gets asked all the time about black holes and whether they really suck you in like a vacuum. Um, and, and yes, I am one of the people that asked them that. Um, <laughs> and, and me, uh, what do I get asked? Well, I get asked, how do you kill people and get away with it? Um, I'm not an assassin. I'm just a chemist with uh, interesting life experiences. Uh, and the reason, maybe I should, I should full disclosure here, the, one of the reasons why I get asked about killing people a lot uh, is because for the last five or six years, I've hosted forensic science panels at big genre cons like Dragon Con and Geek Girl Con and Convergence. Um, and so think about it as how to get away with murder as a Q&A not a television show. <laughs> and these genre cons, you know, they're all kinds of people that come to these. Um, scientists and non-scientists, you know, uh, geeks, dweebs, dorks, nerds, so my people. Uh, and also, you know, cool kids and jocks. It's, it's a real mixed bag in the audience. So it's a great way to do science communication. We just get, you know, all kinds of questions when we do these panels. Um, and these panels are so much fun. Uh, to do these murder panels. And that might seem really weird. Why would it be fun? Um, but first, I want to give you the same disclaimer that I always give the panels. i put on my serious face now. Murder is serious, and murder is wrong. And if we're sarcastic or outlandish, it's not because those things aren't true. It's because we're trying to cope with really complicated things and really awful things. And, and we're trying to talk about the science involved in that. Um, and it's just a way to cope with, with difficult stuff. It's, it's gallows humor. Uh, and it's, it's not meant to be disrespectful. And with that, I usually open up the panel for questions. And we get all kinds of questions, deliciously evil questions, because um, people have great imaginations. And a lot of people have given murder a lot of thought. <laughs> So, I'll be working for a very long time. <laughs> and you can imagine that a panel with an anthropologist, a biologist, a chemist, a geologist, an engineer, an entomologist, we'd have all kinds of answers. You'd get a different answer for, for every question, uh, except for that one question. It was one question where we all gave the same answer. Where would you kill someone? Well, clearly the answer is a national park. You know, it's isolated, it's remote, they're scavenger predators. I don't think I need to go on. Uh, <laughs> it's good. It's good. Uh, and as a chemist, you know, we're, we're you know, quite famous in fiction for killing all kinds of people in, in interesting and exciting ways. Uh, so I filled it all kinds of questions. But there was one question that I got at a panel that really threw me for a loop. And it threw me back into time. Somebody right in the front said, they started their question with, so my friend was murdered. You can imagine that the room's mood completely changed. Up until then, you know, there was lots of gallows humor and inappropriate jokes and outlandish schemes. And it changed in an instant with, so my friend was murdered. And I know that in the two seconds between the end of that person's question and my answer, I, I know it was only two seconds, but it 
felt much longer. And in that two seconds, I relived an entire day. In that two seconds, I was no longer in the panel room. I was in a basement morgue looking at a little girl. <laughs> a little girl who's looked so much like my niece to this day. It still takes my breath away. A little girl whose short life had obviously been filled with so much pain. And I didn't do a good job. I still don't do a good job when I talk about it. And what I mean by a good job is being the stoic professional. I had a job to do. At the time that this occurred, I was just a flunky intern trying to learn the ropes. And one of the most important things that I was going to have to learn was to process life's cruelty much faster so that I could do my job. You see, every one of us, I think, in this room, if we were to die in mysterious circumstances, someone would cry for us, and someone would grieve for us, and someone would be so angry that this had happened to us. And those are the people that love us, right? Those are our, our loved ones. Those are our friends and our family. But maybe you don't know this. There's a second group of people, strangers to you, that will care for you too. But they will care for you in a different way. They will care for you by being thorough and task oriented They will care for you by being accurate and precise. These are the forensic pathologists and the crime scene analysts and the toxicologists and the print examiners. They're people that maybe you don't know in your everyday life, but they will demonstrate care by doing their job and doing it well and giving some type of answer and, and maybe some type of closure to that other group of people that will care about you in the emotional way, because they knew you and they loved you. I had to get to the point, I had to learn to be that stoic professional, because I needed to be able to step up and do my job and do it quickly and efficiently with the skills and experience that I had. I didn't have, I wasn't in that other group and I couldn't act like I was, because I had a job to do. And I first learned that and how to do that by failing at it spectacularly in that basement morgue. I did not hold it together. I cried and I took involuntary steps back. That is not what you do in that type of job. But I got better at it and I was able to, instead of stepping back, to step forward and to do my work and to demonstrate care. I don't do that kind of work anymore. I came back to academia, but I brought with me some of the ability to be the stoic professional. Back in that panel room, I switched into that mode and I answered that person's question that it started with, so my friend was murdered. And I answered it professionally, and I hope with compassion. But there was no gallows humor. It wasn't the place for it. What do you do after a question like that? Because the panel was an hour long, and we were about 30 minutes in. Well, here's what happened next. We went right back to being absurd about murder and making fun of Bones, a show we all can't stand. <laughs> and, and lamenting over why we don't get sunglasses like CSI Miami. And that may seem like a, a wild shift, just this ability to, to, to go from jovial to this 
so my friend was murdered moment in a panel, but it didn't feel that way. It didn't feel jarring. It felt like life. Life brings us moments that take our breath away. And sometimes we'll cry, and sometimes we will scream, and sometimes we will laugh, and sometimes we do all three. It's how we've learned to cope. It's something that I'm still learning. Thank you. That was Rachel Burks. After a few years working in a crime lab, Rachel returned to academia teaching and forensic science research. As an analytical chemist, she enjoys the challenge of developing detection methods for a wide variety of analytes, including regulated drugs and explosives. She also helped create and organized SciPop Talks, a popular talk series blending science and pop culture. She's a popular science communicator, appearing on the Science Channel's Outrageous Acts of Science, ACS Reactions videos, Royal Society of Chemistry podcasts, and at genre conventions such as Dragon Con and Geek Girl Con. If you enjoyed today's story or a fan of the podcast, please consider supporting us on Patreon.com. If you sign up to donate $10 a month or more, we'll list your name in our show programs across the country. The Story Collider is grateful for the support of the Tiffany & Company Foundation and of Science Sandbox, a Simons Foundation initiative dedicated to engaging everyone with the process of science. The Story Collider is produced by Liz Neely, Aaron Barker, Ari Daniel, Christine Gentry, Shane Hanlon, Rosie Waldron, Cassie Soliday, and Nissa Greenberg, with help from Farah Ahmad, Eli Chen, and Skylar Baer. The podcast is produced by Zoe Saunders, and the theme music is by Ghost. Special thanks to the Highland Ballroom and Oberon for hosting these shows, and to our artistic director, Aaron Barker, whose birthday this week we are celebrating with this death-themed episode. Thanks for listening. Pulling up to Mickey D's just for drinks? Oh yeah, that's me. Nothing extra, just perfection and a straw. Coming in hot for the coldest cups on the block. Because there are drinks. Then there are drinks from McDonald's. Ever combine an ice cold frozen Coke with piping hot fries? Try frozen drinks any size for $1.49. Prices and participation may vary. Cannot be combined with any other offer. Ba-da-ba-ba-ba.